So um, this is my friend, Cynthia Minton. We've known each other since the mid seventies back in Idaho. And um, Cindy's had a really varied career in nursing, but is, um, or was certified in uh, wound management. So she's my go-to person every time I have a wound. And um, we had this, this PowerPoint presentation um, with the Nehalem Bay Emergency Volunteer Corps um, maybe two and a half years ago. And the, um, the person who put together the PowerPoint said that we could uh, use it. And so I um, asked Cindy if she would present it to us so that we'd have an opportunity for um, Q&A as we went along. And if you all would kind of be thinking about what um, supplies we might need for wound management as we go through the presentation, that would be great. Just a reminder to everyone, the reason that we've collected IV fluids for our caches is not because we're going to administer IVs, but it's because we would use the IV fluid as an irrigation solution. Um, with that, I'll just um, turn it over to Cindy and I'm gonna look and see if I can tell who all the participants are somehow. And uh... I would ask everybody to mute their uh, devices during the presentation and just uh, open up your mic when you want to ask a question. Oh, and one more thing, Cindy. Um, we invited our citizen emergency response team members to um, participate today also, as well as our disaster animal response team members. So um, there's three teams or potentially people from three teams on the um, presentation today. Okay. So um, can we have the first slide? I know I'm not. Okay, so the next, well, no, this, this second one, the assessment part. And I apologize, I am not, um, I'm definitely not, uh, savvy in technology. So anyway, in looking at this one, uh, it's just sort of um, a little bit of a guide. And um, the first thing though I would add to that is to make sure that it is safe to approach the patient or I don't know what we want to call them, individuals, um, and also observe universal precautions, which mean all body fluids with the exception of sweat. And so first you would want to identify what you're looking at so you can choose what to do. Um, next would be control bleeding. And one of the things with, we have two options for um, bleeding, which would be compression or, and a tourniquet. However, tourniquets are um, not used very frequently. And um, so, if you were considering that, you might want to have a more um, detailed presentation on that. Uh, compression would be our first choice. Um, the first thing you would want to do is to help the person remain calm. And um, if the cut is very large and bleeding profusely, you would want them to lie down. And if it's on, if the wound is on an arm or a leg, you want, would want to raise the limb above the heart to help slow the bleeding. Um, the next step would be, and this is, I'm, I'm sort of um, going through the initial wound care part. So first you would um, remove the obvious debris from the wound, such as sticks or grass or dirt that, I mean, what you can actually pick up. Um, wash out the wound with clean water and saline or um, what you have available. If you have um, antiseptics available such as betadine, um, hydrogen peroxide or chlorhexidine, those would be good things to initially clean the wound with but should not be used after as they, while they destroy the bacteria, they also destroy um, new cell growth. So, so can I interject for a second? Sure. Um, we do have um, 
hydrogen peroxide and we do have um, chlorhyd chlorhexidine. Chlorhexidine, thanks. Yeah, and that's awesome because that, those are both really good um, cleaning, initial cleaning um, types of uh, liquids. Um, and, and you know, I, the IV idea for cleaning wounds is um, excellent in that um, you can get some pressure if you're running it even through a, because we were just talking about the pressure of cleaning a wound. Sometimes you can use like a Foley catheter syringe that's really big and um, put to wash it out. Um, so the, another thing I would just like to point out here when um, you're doing wound care is that, and it, again, if you have an option and you have gloves available um, to change your gloves after you have, um, once you've cleaned it to change the gloves to uh, apply a dressing so that everything stays clean. Nothing's gonna be sterile. So just the best cleanliness that you can do. Um, so if, it's, if you're using compression, you would want to fold a cloth or a bandage. And in order for compression to work, you've got to um, apply pressure for a long time, which up to 10 minutes. And if it soaks through that initial thing you have, put another layer, don't remove the one that you have there and continue to apply pressure. So, so um, the next, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm still on the first slide and I would have added flat slides if I'd had if I knew how, okay. I mean, I know how to do PowerPoints, but not to add to this. So um, then you wanna look at the wound for the severity and type. And there's actually seven types of wounds that you are likely to come across. The first one would be an incision wound, which is clean and straight and caused by sharp objects. Um, they tend to bleed heavily and because multiple vessels are cut when that occurs. And, um, and ligaments and tendons also may in, be involved, but this would be a place where you would want to use compression to try and stop that. The next type is laceration. And those are the more messy ones caused by tearing or crushing um, forces. They don't tend to bleed as much as incised wounds, but can cause more damage to the surrounding tissue. The next one is abrasions, and those are caused by scraping or friction. And um, they tend not to be deep, but often have a lot of foreign material in them. And then the next category would be a puncture. And they may appear small from the outside, but they may damage a lot of deep tissues. Um, and they're particularly dangerous in chest, abdomen, head, where major organs are at risk. The sixth one is an avulsion, and that's caused by a tearing force. And that would mean that there is tissue that is actually gone or torn away. And again, those would bleed profusely, you know, depending on the size and the um, location. And then the final one is amputation or loss of a distinct body part. So I'm, I just wanna say here, when we look at assess what the resources you have available to you, I'm really impressed with what's been accomplished um, with the different sites for supplies, et cetera. Um, very impressive. So determine um, a plan of action. Um, if you, the general wound care would be applying comp compression and getting the, the um, these are just little reminders. Um, change your gloves between cleaning and applying the dressing if you can. Um, and another thing that's really important is to put, if, you, if possible, to document the date and time that dressing was put on. Um, another just reminder is if you're wrapping a limb, always start from the bottom 
and work up to wherever the wound is to prevent swelling below the dressing. And, um, and then the final one that determine appropriate follow-up um, and communicate that with the patient or whoever is with them so they'll know what to do next. And, um, you know, I'm thinking of this as an accredited the first line defense. And, you know, you're probably not going to be continuing to care for these wounds. Okay, now I can have the second slide. Thank you. So these are the different kinds of wound damage or drainage. And um, you're probably not going to see much of this except the um, bloody part. Um, or you might see the serosanguinous that is um, serous uh, drainage with uh, blood mixed in. So that's the lower pink one. And then serous was just a thin, clear yellow. Um, that would be something that you would see in a blister. And let's see, and then the purulent, you're probably not gonna see this, the purulent um, creamy yellow or green because they're not gonna have time to have developed that. Okay, so, so the next um, slide is recognizing healthy tissue. Again, um, these are more with uh, wounds that have already occurred. And granulation tissue is of course the best. And it's um, bright red and, and it looks sort of bumpy. And, um, and it has to be present to develop the skin tissue. Um, the slide on the right is, is showing slough. And that is the, those little um, how, white or uh, cream colored areas. And um, skin tissue can't grow over that or through it. So that has to be removed. Again, again this is more chronic wound care um, on the, slut, this, the uh, second uh, example. So, the next slide, please. So this was the, the eschar, um, which is basically a scab. And it's black and soft and hard and leathery. And it's actually not a bad thing. This is the body's um, protection. And so we really wouldn't want to disturb an eschar because it is protecting the tissue underneath. Now the slough, I referred to that in the previous uh, slide and you can see a really good example of the slough and that wound is not gonna heal without removing that slough. Again, this is not something that you will deal with because you're doing acute wounds rather than chronic wounds. Okay, hey, so deep traumatic wound, which is full thickness, um, meaning it's gone through all the layers of the skin. You're now seeing fat and muscle that is exposed and even bone. So with what we've been talking about um, and maybe from your previous thing, what would be your treatment of this wound? if you saw something like this come. Any volunteers? <laughs> okay, I don't hear any. Okay, so, go ahead. Uh, certainly, um, good irrigation would probably be a place to start. Right, perfect. I think this one's uh, gonna need to be packed. Okay. So this wound, um, it's clean. It, well, it's not clean. It needs to be irrigated. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that I would recommend in um, uh, some of the supplies you have are to have non-adherent dressings. Um, because if you just put a piece of gauze over that, 
when that's removed, it's going to do um, debridement or pull off good tissue with bad tissue when um, it is next being seen. So any kind of um, gauze that is permeated in um, Vaseline or whatever would be a good first layer for this wound. And then of course, oh, go ahead. Cynthia, we have uh, iodoform gauze too. Okay, great. That's good because then you've got the, uh, the iodine that's gonna be killing. Um, now that's not something you would wanna leave in place for a long time because it, because it is very drying to wounds. Um, but as an initial thing to keep it from sticking to a dressing, that's excellent because you're going to have the antibacterial mm -hmm. uh, component also. And Gabriella just gave us um, a whole bunch of telfa, large telfa pads. Awesome. And then there's that you, another... can, that you can just cut up and you can make whatever size you need. Right. Perfect. And that's a good point right there is... Um, to be to go ahead and don't apply the whole thing, but cut it so that you have more that you can use in other circumstances. So this wound isn't bleeding a lot. And so you would want to put a non-adherent and then an absorptive level, which could be just plain gauze and then cover this. Okay, and the next one. Now, this is not really, there's not really much that um, other than cleaning it. And again, applying a non-adherent dressing and then um, packing, well, laying another layer of gauze over it and maybe wrapping it. I don't know if you have curl X um, because this is not something that really you can do much with except try to cover and protect. You know, this would be a great place for the um, iodoform gauze to keep the bacteria uh, level down. And the following um, one is very similar to the above one. You just wanna preserve what's there and protect it from further contamination. Um, and by preserving it, not putting gauze in it, because again, when they pull the dry gauze out, it, it indiscriminately pulls all other tissue out too. And we want all to preserve all the good tissue that we can possibly keep. Okay. Okay, so I, the next one, so skin tears are a really, um, you know, really common, particularly in, it looks like people in our age group, <laughs> including myself or somebody who's been on cortisone. Um, and the thing with this is you want to try when you see something like this and the skin is peeled back it, the most important thing is try to get that, that skin, that to unfurl that skin and place it over back over where it was. Um, because if you do that, it's very likely that that skin will readhere. Now, now that's really in, in that kind of scenario, it would be something that has recently happened um, so that you possibly could um, have, like I said, have that um, re-adhere and you wouldn't have as big an area left open. And this is actually an avulsion where the, or it can be an avulsion, um, where all of the tissue is gone and then it would be the same kind of treatment that you would do with um, the deeper wounds where you would want not want to put um, gauze over it. I recently did a, a wound assessment on a gentleman who they had immediately put gauze on and it took our staff at the hospice house, I'm, I'm still currently a hospice nurse, um, it took, the 
staff at our hospice house about three days to get that gauze off without totally just ripping all the tissue out and by moistening it and trying to worry it up. So the best thing, um, if you come across one of these, if you have a Q-tip that's moistened, you can sort of worry that, um, that skin back over where it, where it can adhere. And if, it, you know, short of that, a finger, anything to try and get that um, over the, the um, area that's uncovered. Uh, Cindy, can I make a comment? Sure. Um, that uh, piece of skin also acts as a dressing. In other words, it's correct. there's Good. a raw, raw area. Even if it dies, it becomes usually a dried crust that acts like a Band-Aid. And it, mm -hmm. it's, it isn't pussy or dirty. You can leave it intact, especially if you're not in a setting where you can you know, deal with the wound directly. It also cuts down on pain. It covers the endings of the nerves. So there's a lot of advantages to preserving that skin. And a non-stick dressing, as you made the point, is crucial because anything that sticks will remove that skin when it comes off. So Perfect. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, Thanks. excellent. excellent. And, 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 and to just add to that, even if it like the, the picture on the top, the skin uh -huh. looks black yeah. and, and it can look like that and you, everybody can go, oh, well, you know, we don't need that. It's just dead because it's black. It Leave it, you know, exactly. even if it's black and it may not be dead uh, because underneath that skin will grow. And even if it pushes this layer up, um, that that what it looks like and it's black and dead, it's not. It's really, really important as long as it's already been cleaned and there's nothing festering underneath of it. So it needs to be opened and cleaned and then put the flap back down. Right. And um, re I'm refer gonna refer back, that would be an eschar or a scab as we most, um, that we most refer to. And eschar is actually a good thing. Um, and in certain wounds, you do not disturb an eschar. You try to maintain that. I'm not gonna go into that because again, that is a lot of chronic wound care. And I think I missed one, you know, when we are assessing whether this is a chronic or acute wound, if they have a chronic wound and the dressing is intact and it hasn't been um, saturated with a lot of dirty water or um, things like that, leave those chronic um, wound dressings in place. Do not try to address those unless like I say that it's saturated with stuff that you need to get off of the wound. Um, and you know, a lot of people do have chronic wounds. So just keep that in mind. You're probably gonna be addressing more acute things that need um, more critical care. So thanks both of you for contributing to that. Okay, so the next one is um, road rash or abrasions. And um, in this one is also the, the um, blistering. And the road rash, while it is very, very painful, um, like this says, it must be thoroughly cleaned for rocks, grass, debris. And um, again, cover, you can use Neosporin. I have steered more away from Neosporin and some of the antibacterial ointments because um, as we've developed the super um, uh, germs, whatever, this, this super, um, okay, I'm stumbling. Anyway, um, I don't believe that uh, it really offers that much anymore. Is, does, is it going to be harmful? No, not unless a person is allergic to it. So either is fine. But again, um, be sure that you put something moist over that. So again, you don't have gauze, just gonna debride that wound. Um, again, hydrocolloid is awesome. It acts as a second skin. It stays in place, it's waterproof uh, and you can leave it on for um, a, a week without any problems. Now the blistering, I know um, lo are lots of times that, um, you want to poke a blister and get the fluid out. And it sort of depends on where, what stage that blister is in. Um, if you poke, poke it, you're going to prevent it from bursting on its own, which is going to have a bunch of ragged edges, which is a good thing. 
However, you can um, again put a non-adherent dressing over a blister and put a little bit of compression on it. And lots of times that fluid will reabsorb and again that skin will attach and you're not going to get as bad a wound as you would have, because anytime you puncture a wound, then you're offering an inlay for bacteria, et cetera, to get into the wound. Any questions on that? I do, I do have a question about, is that the same for burns? Because I heard that for burns, you might wanna poke it because you don't want it to put pressure on the tissue below. <laughs> Um, well, I, it, again, it depends on the, how, how bad the blister is. If it's at risk of bursting open on its own, then yes, that is an excellent way because then you don't have all the jagged edges. However, um, the stuff that's below is sterile. It is serous fluid and um, lots of time and really wound healing is all about moist wound healing and it can reabsorb and reattach just like the skin tears do. So this one, I mean, this one on her lower leg is questionable as to whether that will burst on its own. Um, so I still would probably try and preserve that by giving it a little bit of compression. And I'm talking about, um, I don't know, are, are you guys using, do you have Coban? Yeah. Um, you wouldn't want to put the Coban on directly, but if you put a Telfa and a little bit of Coban, and are you familiar with the term stretch back on Coban? It, are in, is anybody familiar no. with that term? No, okay, go ahead so, and explain that, Cynthia. That's good. Okay. Go ahead and explain that. Okay, so um, Coban, you can decide how much pressure to put on that wound. Mm -hmm. And if you stretch Coban to its various, um, to its, where it stops being stretchy, that's when you start measuring. And, you know, so somebody will say, do 100% stretch back. What that means is that you would stretch it all out and let it come back in and then wrap it. If you want a little more compression, then you would stretch it out a quarter of the way and that will give you, um, you know, it'll give you a little compression. Now, if you stretch it all the way back and wrap it, you're gonna have really heavy duty compression. and lots of times that can cause more problems than it can help. So it sort of depends on um, how much compression you want. It's an awesome tool, but you have to keep in mind that you don't wanna compress things too much. So something like this, I would probably try a Telfa and using Coban do a 25% stretch back to give it just a little bit of compression. That's that's all go, also going to really help the pain mm -hmm. um, to support that. Yes. And it also supports I, I, the tissues around there. Yes, yeah, Cindy, I agree with you on the question of the blister and whether to break it or not. In Especially with burns, which Gabriella mentioned, you know, we're, we're often working on wounds every day or two or three times a day. So we might break the blister and clean it off even in the OR. But in our store set, store set, in an austere setting, I would definitely think of that blister as a Band-Aid. It cuts down on pain. It protects the wound from getting infected, actually. It may eventually, but it's, it's a sterile environment underneath. And I totally agree with you. I would wrap it with a nonstick dressing and something that's not too tight and keep the blisters in, in this austere setting. Perfect, yeah. thank you. Yeah. And I have, I have a question about using Coban. After, with time, it it sh it will shrink and cause more compression. So, might it? Well, it if you do a hundred percent stretch back, which means that you are just and, and and you do you're right about when you are unrolling it, you are you're stretching it at that time. 
And so when you unroll it, you have to allow it to go all the way back in for it not to put compression on there. You're absolutely right about that. The other thing too is about Coban, um, the narrower, narrower it is, the more compression it's gonna put. So uh, I prefer using like four inch Coban, um, you know, three inches okay, but four inches good because then you don't have to worry so much about that risk of that continued compression. Does that make sense? It, it does. Um, I, and it, you know, I, I think you just have to realize that there is risk of using Coban. And a lot of people don't realize that, I think. What about, uh, I think I'd want to use Curlix and maybe with a final wrapping, light wrapping of Coban. Perfect. And one of the reasons you would never want to put um, Coban directly on the skin. It's very irritating. And I would always use Curlex underneath Coban, regardless of what was, or, you know, unless I had a large telfa that would again protect the skin. But always use um, something underneath the Coban. The Coban is really as compression and not as a dressing, or it is used to hold a dressing in place. Um, lots of times when people can't tolerate tape on the skin because that causes injury, we will use 100% stretch back Coban to uh, apply those kinds of dressings. I just want to add that it's going to be also dependent on what we have available in a disaster oh, of course. time, right? So we might not have certain things and ideal conditions available. So we'll just use what we have. I don't know how much Coban we have, Lila, for our care site. We, we have a fair amount, I believe. Um, okay, and there's there's another product that um, is available, which is called Clean. It's mm -hmm. very similar to Curlex, although it has the compression um, ability too. Not as much as Coban, but it does have some compression capability. And um, you can't use it inner, you know, exchanging Curlex and Coban because I mean Curlex and Clean because the cling does have compression power. I'd like to add just a, a small comment, specifically about Coban, but any, any bandage. First, if you have, you can have subsequent swelling after you apply the bandage, which would then cause the compression or the tightness to get worse. And so you're not, this is not a one-off and you're walking away and ignoring the patient after that. You're monitoring mm -hmm. the, the appendage and especially uh, distal and and uh, un, you know changing the dressing and monitoring things and, and loosening it if need be. So again to reiterate if I was going to dress that that um, blister there I would wrap the entire lower limb with Curlex and Coban. Mm -hmm. That would prevent prevent the swelling below the dressing. Yes. Um, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Again, um, and I, you know, I don't, ex if, if you are in an austere setting, you're going to do the best you can. And um, again, with this one, you would not, if you couldn't, um, you know, wrap the entire lower limb, then you're going to want to do a hundred percent stretch back um, Coban. Remember, you stretch it out. And as you pull it off the roll, um, because you're pulling it, it does, if you just apply it there, you are going to get compression with it. So the stretch back thing is you pull off, you know, 24 inches of it and let it stretch back, grab it again. And then, well, you can start applying it. And again, um, the way you apply it, be sure that it rolls off as you're applying because it's really hard to un try and unroll as you're um, applying it to a, to a limb or wherever you're applying it. I know that doesn't make sense. I wish I <clears throat> had um, some to show you, but anyway.
And okay, and any other questions on that? Coban is an awesome tool, but it is a tool. So, um, you know, use it um, judiciously. Okay, the next one. So la lacerations, um, steri strips can be used for superficial wounds. Um, it I like this, this demonstration here. I have never been able to apply steri strips very well. And this shows you how, um, putting on two steri strips, making sure they stick and then pulling the wound together. Um, these of course would have to be cleaned well. You would have to have a dry area around the wound, a very dry area to get those steri strips to um, hold. Um, oh, Cindy. Uh huh. We have um, steri strips and tincture of benzoin, and we we do have sutures, but our inclination has been that in an austere environment we would steer away from sutures and prefer steri strips. Correct, and I would. Um, encourage you to consider um, actually getting some of the medical super glue. I was just wondering uh, about that because I glue my spouse to get it all the time. <laughs> yeah. This is Margo and um, I did a lot of wound care and all the years I was a home health nurse. And even back then we used steri strips a lot because you, you know, we went in homes all over the place and you never knew what you were going to encounter on a visit. Even if it was a wound care visit, there might be a new wound, right? Or a right. New trauma and steri strips until they could be seen by a provider, get sutures or have a follow-up visit from the nurse. They actually worked really well. And in fact, I use them at home with my kids when they were growing because they always had injuries. And um, so I think that they can be very helpful on a temporary basis. Oh, I totally agree with you. Um, I've actually been using the super glue a lot on myself and it's not medical grade, but it still worked. <laughs> just saying. But, um, so it's just another consideration. Um, this this um, arm wound here would be much better with the steroid strips than the glue. I mean, the glue would be something like a, a, um, the type of wound that, the incision type of wound that's clean and you know, you're just trying to approximate the edges. So. I saw a hospitalized patient for an infection after a puncture wound uh, he had used super glue. He was accustomed to yeah. using that. And not good idea. Sealing the the bacteria and and it got pretty serious. Very, yeah, of course. But I do have a question about using uh, the medical grade super glue. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never seen that used, uh, and just not in a place where it was applied. How do you keep the edges dry enough to uh, adhere the size? Well, first you have to, you know, try to get that bleeding stopped, you know, with pre compression. And um, so some of the things that they, it's nice because it dries fast and does help stop the bleeding. Um, and it stays in place keeps, you know, again, protects it, keeps the dirt and stuff out of there. Um, and it wears off in time. And um, so. Oh, it seems like a good idea. I just don't no, know. No, 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 I know. And I, I actually looked it up to see some of the, um, you know, the takeaways. It, it does work really well um, for, but it has to be a cleaner wound. I mean, again, I would not use it on this arm we're looking at. Um, because again, when you talked about a puncture wound and you're gluing, you know, gluing a puncture wound together, that is, or this, this does, is not a clean wound. I mean, it needs a lot of um, cleaning out and whatever. So, 
And anyway. Anyway, can I just make one comment about the super glue? You uh -huh. need help to do this, okay? The wound needs to be very clean, like she said, very dry, no bleeding, and that means it has to be fast. So you need somebody to be doing that beautiful approximation for you. Someone else's hands, gloved hands doing that, and you just line the glue like that, and you're done. Right. So mm -hmm. it really, you need help, and it needs to be fast. <laughs> okay. Right. So one, one other thing about super glue, I, I looked up the non-medical and learned that it is toxic and it will absorb. I, I don't know how much it would take to seriously uh, cause any problem, but that was one reason why the medical super glue is developed. Right. And actually they started using um, super glue in World War II. Oh, wow that some of the adhesive they were using um, to keep dressings on and the medics in the field started using it to glue some of the wounds together. I, I found that very interesting. And then they really um, perfected it in the Vietnam War. That's when they really started using. Um, and, you know, we're now using it in, you know, general practice, but just interesting background of where it came from. So um, again, it has to be a really clean, fast wound. And I've used the non-medical because uh, when I've used my rotary cutter, um, I've cut myself, you know, it's nice and clean and I can hold it together. <laughs> anyway, I shouldn't tell on myself. Okay, <laughs> let's go to the puncture wounds. And as Matt was talking about, you do not want to close a puncture wound. Um, these are wounds that are probably more like an iceberg. You're only seeing the top portion of it and there's a lot of um, other stuff going underneath the skin. Um, you're gonna have swelling, bruising and pain. If there's foreign bodies, of course you wanna remove those um, and you want to leave them open so that all the um, debris and stuff can come out. Um, that also goes for any kind of um, really do uh, like a, a um, animal bite. You never close an animal bite, although I have had a doctor close a dog bite on me, which I came home and took the stitches out of. But um, anyway, because you're just closing in all that stuff that has been forced into that wound. Any questions on that or comments? Okay, let's go to the next. Actually, I, I had one. Um, okay. Um, uh, a puncture. Uh, you don't want to close it, but you want to. Uh, Protect it bleeding at a, if, assuming it is bleeding. I mean, I guess if right. then you don't. I'm not hard. saying not, you can, you know, you can, you would want to put, you would want to cover it to prevent other stuff getting in. You just would not want to totally close it and close all that bacteria that's been forced um, into the body. Don't try to approximate it, just try to to, yeah, and yeah, yeah, and you want to protect it, and put a, dr a dressing on it, a simple band aid or something. Um, but yeah, not close it. Totally close it. Okay, so venous insufficiency in, in lower extremities. Again, this is more um, chronic stuff. Uh, it does introduce you to things that, uh, that you might be seeing in the field, you wouldn't necessarily be treating. Um, and the treatment is elevation, moisturizers and compression. Again, light compression. Um, but these are more chronic. I guess mostly what I'm saying is if you see this kind of um, presentation in the field like this one leg that is black, necrotic, it looks necrotic, 
um, you can tell that the circulation isn't that good and it does have some swelling in it, but um, you're really probably not gonna treat that. That's more of a chronic wound or chronic condition. Anything else on that? Okay. Pitting edema. Um, again, congestive heart failure. Um, this, I'm, I'm sure you could come across patients or individuals who do have congestive heart failure and have um, edema of the lower extremities. Um, I, this would not be something I think that you would, um, I, well, let me put it this way. Your priority would not be um, areas that are closed and not open to um, other environmental types of um, exposure. So traumatic edema is different. Um, you would wanna elevate it. Um, so with this lower wound, this is a wound where you would want to add a little bit of light compression. And one of the things that the light compression does is it really helps with the pain. If you think of it as um, holding the, all those tissues together and supporting them while it begins to heal, um, it, it just, well, like it says, it creates a natural splint and it does help with the pain. Cynthia, what about uh, ice for the traumatic edema? Again, Certainly. for Absolutely. circulation yeah. and pain management. And, you know, it's not continuous ice. You know, you would want to put uh, 15 minutes at a time uh, every couple of hours. Um, you don't, certainly don't want to cause damage from being too cold. Um, Can I just give an example mm -hmm. of something that I did in the, in the field? This was the bottom of the Grand Canyon. And it was a wrist fracture and it was closed. So we had no skin opening. And for, we, of course, we didn't have a lot of ice down there. and It was pretty hot. Um, but what I did was the, the water temperature of the river was really, really cold, really cold. Um, so we packed this arm um, um, in mud every night. Um, so we would stop um, and set up camp. And this was an eight day trip. And this woman broke her wrist on the first rapid, no lie. Uh -oh. so we, pa we packed this lower arm and wrist and hand in mud every night, this freezing cold mud awesome. from the bottom of the river. And it was fabulous. It was yep. wonderful. It felt wonderful. She was very happy. The edema went down within two days. Um, it helped with the bruising and it was, it was just great. So, I mean, you can get pretty creative about using cold. <laughs> right. Very good. Yeah. Thanks for the example. Okay, the uh, crush. Go ahead. Uh, uh, the lower one, uh, traumatic edema, uh, almost looks like a compression or a, a compartmental syndrome. Right, it does. Uh, that someone actually incised. I mean, this one obviously is traumatic, but um, uh, Bob Wayne or uh, Matt, uh, any. If, if you saw you know, basically all the signs and symptoms of a, a cartmental uh, syndrome, would we take an incision and do a fasciotomy? No. No? Okay. Well, I'm, that's my opinion. And I'm just talking about this particular, this particular wound. Because you're going to have, I mean you know, you're going to have all the redness and all the body response and the swelling and whatever. Um, if it's a true compression one, you certainly don't want to um, add more compression. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll try to answer that. Uh, in this environment, I, I'd be really reluctant to do a fasciotomy. So, I mean, I, I would say don't add anything to the pressure, but... But it's a very good question, Nick. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, that's what I would say. I mean, as a wound care nurse, I would never consider that. 
if I had a doctor that said that and did that, I would certainly support it and help, but I would not make that determination myself. So that's, and you, you know, again, in those kind of austere things, you do the best you can. And so the next um, slide is about a crush injury with compartment syndrome. And um, again, this would be a medical decision. Uh, you would want to support what is, you would want to clean the area and cover it. And, and uh, you know, this might be somebody that you would uh, want to get to medical care. If you're, if you're doing prioritization, this would be a priority for um, somebody to get immediate medical care. Um, again, I wouldn't mess with it. Okay, next slide. And this is the ex explaining the compartment syndrome. Um, actually, the finger that I had a dog bite with, I they were concerned about a compress a um, compartment syndrome. As it turned out, um, I did not have this procedure, but it was it was sort of certainly touch and go whether I was going to lose that finger or not. So it is very serious. Okay, yeah. next slide. Cynthia, since there yes. are a handful of people that are not medical um, trained, can you just do a quick definition of compartmentalization syndrome? Okay, so it the swelling, actually, why don't we have the doctor do it? Yeah, the, um, when, an, when there's an injury to a leg, especially kind of a crush sometimes, there are three major, in the lower leg, there's three major compartments. There's actually a fourth, I think. But there's three major compartments and the, 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 the fascia and the wrapping around each of those compartments um, has a specific nerve supply and blood supply that we're, we're usually cognitive of. And it's really hard even for a doctor many times to decide enough whether to proceed with a fasciotomy or not. The biggest thing that we, we tend to find out, and it's often late, is whether you lose feeling and the, the, and the, uh, uh, the capillary return, you know, stuff that you, uh, the, the blood pressure you can feel at the ankle and so on, help you to decision, make that decision to do the fasciotomy. But, um, uh, and those are really tough decisions sometimes. But if you come in too late, uh, then uh, the, the blood supply is lost and the extremity part has to be, often has to be amputated. So we would go in and release the pressure and that's more technical than I have to give you. You can see good pictures here uh, of the, the virtually the different compartments and uh, uh, the pressure that builds up that shuts off nerve and blood supply to those areas will tend to end up uh, giving you a, a non-viable leg. And by releasing those, by making those incisions, um, you're letting the, the muscles and the fascial compartments that are tight, the three main ones we said, you would be opening those up so that the, the muscles can bulge out and therefore the pressure and the swelling uh, in, in, and even some of the fluid can come out. And then we later would go ahead and secondarily close those wounds. Uh, it would be technically difficult to do in an austere situation. I really think, although, I mean, it's, it'd be possible. Um, I don't think so. And I think that um, uh, the after um, uh, management of it would be equally as complicated. So I might accept losing the lower extremity and maybe considering an amputation along the way, as opposed to doing a fasciotomy in the field. But I really don't know the answer to that. I can ask my military friends. I know what I would do with an operating room, but I don't really know in an OSIS situation. So if you want me to, I'll ask uh, the trauma surgeon at OHSU about that. He's, he's military also. Does that help? Yeah, it really does help. I mean, you know, the the um, the swelling and the compression it, it it stops all the circulation, yeah. and so the limb dies. That compartment dies. So, um, yeah, that's. I wouldn't touch it. Nope. <laughs> just so, Kathy, do you have any suggestions? I'm just. How do you feel about that? I mean. I think that in, you know, in an austere setting, and I'm talking, you know, you're at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, you're out someplace where you can't get to any help. 
or help is, is far away or you need a, a satellite helicopter or something like that, don't create additional trauma. You know, because you're, you're creating, with a fasciotomy, you're creating some serious additional trauma. And so then you have a whole nother thing, a set of things to deal with. And yes, maybe the, the compartment syndrome won't be able to be relieved by the time, whatever, but you haven't done it. Okay, you're, you're creating that additional trauma. Um, so, and I would be comfortable making that decision um, and say yes or no. And I don't wanna be the person responsible for creating additional trauma. Yeah, I would, I would be responsible. The, the issue also is that we don't have any, there's no pain control here, really. I mean, right. when, when you do a fasciotomy, they're often asleep yeah. or, you yeah. know, I mean, so it's, yeah. another, it's another planet yeah. totally, but it is tempting to think about it because, you know, it's, it, the limb will be gone. That's, it, it'll be lost. But I still would accept a lost limb as opposed to setting off other problems that would mm -hmm. add to the patient's, pro, uh, the, the complex problem. Absolutely. So the answer is no. Well, and you know, you if you do a fasciotomy, you have to have all the support for that, and you would not have that. You'd have a pain and screaming patient. That's crazy. Yeah. 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 Couldn't do it. No. I wonder, did the <laughs> non-medical person who asked the question know what uh, the fascia is? So uh, you mean the compartments the where they are? The person that asked the question is medical, but I can just tell oh. from the jargon that somebody would not even understand you know, what compartment syndrome is, what we're talking about. So I just yeah. wanted a really basic um, to help them understand that it's uh, sort of fluid and swelling trapped within the membrane. And as it swells, it puts pressure on the adjacent nerves and blood vessels. That's a very good summary. So I just wanted um, everyone to note that we scheduled this for an hour and we're coming close. So um, I, it's, it, it's great to keep going. I just wanted to point out the timing. Um, actually, there's only a couple of slides left and they're talking about burns. I don't really have you know, much to say on that. Again, um, we can look at, so the first degree burn of course, you would want cold if you can get it. Um, and we're looking at blisters again and pain. Um, you know, putting some compression on those kinds of things really do help with pain. Um, again, not too much. Um, and then the third degree burn, uh, uh, where you do get uh, some of the SR and um, total destruction of um, of the the um, skin, etc. You know, you may get some of the SR stuff we were talking about, the long uh, black non-viable. But again, that is protecting and is actually addressing for a different um, to in in order for that person to get to some um, adequate medical care. So, and, um, and then the next was the emergency supplies. Um, again, you guys have, see down here that uh, the bottom Curlex Conform, that Conform does have compression ability. Another word for it is clean. So, um, they can't really be used interchangeably unless you know that the, con the conform does have compression and you, and you don't want compression, you know, you need to like with the Coban, stretch it back and not apply compression. Cynthia, I just have one comment here. Uh, earlier, much earlier in your presentation, you talked about documenting the date and time uh -huh. um, the last little thing on that list there is Sharpie and you can just do that right on the dressing, just right exactly. on the dressing. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I, you know, that was my, that's where I went. I just didn't say it. <laughs> so right. thank you for clarifying <laughs> that. Yeah. And that's really, particularly if you are using compression, it's, it's, that would be important. And, um, also, I mean, just the date, at least with just a plain old dressing is really helpful to the person that's going to be following up. Um, what, you know, when they go for additional care. So 
thanks. I don't know. Is there any other questions or whatever? Yes, I just sir. want to commend your group on such an awesome response. Uh, this is for Lila. Um, uh, I did make some notes regarding supplies. You asked uh, to do that. Um, I liked uh, Cindy's uh, mention of hydrocolloid. Do we have that? Lila? I'm thinking. I think not, uh, Mick, and I made the same note. Okay, and the, second, <laughs> and the second one uh, is, do we need or do we even, uh, do we even want or have uh, medical super glue? It seems to me like we got super glue as a, um, a donation, but I also put the medical super glue on my list and I'll add the hydrocolloid. Um, and we do have a few, like those long Q-tips, mm -hmm. um, but I can see where more of those would be, um, would be valuable. And the other thing we do have is 20 cc, and I think maybe even 50 cc, but for sure 20 cc syringes for irrigation with some decent pressure. Yes, right. Sir. Fully cathed syringes are the best because they're, you know, 50 cc's and. Yeah, I think we might have 50s, but for sure I know we have 20s. No, we do have 50s. There you go. And, and Lila, talk to me about the hydrocolloid you order because you can order it in big sheets. Um, just like the Telfa where you could cut it up and use it as needed. And um, there are different kinds of hydrocolloid. The one I prefer has a little bit of alginate in it, which um, does uh, provide some absorption. Most hydrocolloids don't, but this is my preferred one that I think would work well for the type of thing you're using it for. Okay, great. <laughs> And I'm guessing that we'd have to have your support for that, Bob Wayne. Uh, yeah, I, I put it on my list as well. I think it's a very good dressing. I've used them in the past. It's easy, it sticks on, it's got lots of, of good uh, features beyond just ordinary uh, gauzes. So it's a great idea. Um, so to, to wrap up, I wanna thank Cindy. This was really an excellent presentation. It was actually more, um, extensive than the one we had at Nehalem Bay. So thank you for doing all that research on it and for um, sharing your expertise. Really appreciate how many people um, came on today. A couple of things I wanted to mention. We do, for those of you who are newer, we do offer Stop the Bleed classes. That This refers to when Cindy was talking about the tourniquets. And, um, but we haven't done that since COVID because it actually requires in person, um, uh, an in person session where you practice doing the um, stopping the bleed. So we haven't offered that since, um, since COVID happened. And then um, the two final thoughts I had are that it would be really, um, fun <laughs> to have for our next drill um, a scenario like one of the ones that we talked about today for a pet and a person and and kind of walk through it as we do our um, exercise at Oscar in um, March. And then um, my final comment is I sent you all um, a survey about participating in um, not only vaccination, not only vaccination clinics where you vaccinate, but where there are other roles to see who would be interested and willing and if you wanted to have the vaccine first. So if you could please um, complete that survey. And Helen, I'll get with you because I'm a little um, unclear about um, the roles of EMTs versus paramedics. And I need your um, help understanding that. I'd be so, happy to do that. So with that, um, I made a list of everybody who participated because I keep track of your time, you know, or the MRC people who participated. And um, thank you all. And thanks, Cindy. I really appreciate. Hey, thanks for all the contribution that I had too. It really helps. So thank you for um, participating.
I, I wonder, I know we're trying to end, but uh, I'm new to the MRC. I'm a, a nurse, uh, retired. And I, at the last um, training we had a month or so ago, I learned that we have uh, military gauze and I wasn't even familiar with that. Lila told me it has a coagulant in it. Uh, how would you apply that in in uh, to a wound? Is there a concern that it would stick to the wound? I guess that was my wondering that. I think you would have to um, weigh the benefits and the advantages to um, the bleeding. I mean. If it's going to stick, yeah. So if if it really needs to be stopped, you know, there's always, um, you know, you can get gauze out, but it takes a lot to soak it off once it's dried. Um, so again, I think it would have to be a decision of a specific event. So, so Matt, the last time I used the the anticoagulant gauze, I had a hiker. And it, we were about an hour and a half from the bottom of our trip and it was downhill all the way and he fell. He fractured his ankle inside of his boot and had a massive bleeding head wound. The ankle inside of the boot, we just left the boot alone and, and put ice sticks on both sides of his ankle and he walked fine on it um, with some pain management. But that head wound, it took me 45 minutes to stop it from bleeding. So that anticoagulant gauze and a bandana around his head and then his hat on for more compression um, because it was bleeding all over his face and we couldn't and he couldn't walk. I had no cell phone reception. We had to get him down. Um, so he wouldn't have had that anticoagulant gauze on very long and in, in the term of a number of hours. But otherwise, I didn't I couldn't figure out how I would have gotten him down because he couldn't see because the blood was just like a sheet in front of his face. Um, so it, you know, it has its place. Um, it just depends, like Cynthia said, is, you know, you have to make a decision in the time and decide the best thing for that particular time. Matt, were you asking how to use that gauze? Because it's used as a packing gauze, not as a wrapping gauze. And it's impregnated with this material mm -hmm. that's, that uh, does stop bleeding. But you often take it out very short time right. to put in regular packing. It's just meant for short term. Right. Does that yeah. answer your question, yeah. Matt? Yes. Yes. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> so um, again, thank you, everybody, and um, and thanks, Matt, for asking questions. I know it's difficult to be the new person, and um, really appreciate that. So um, enjoy the ocean this afternoon. It's a high tide. Mm -hmm. Thanks again, everybody. Thank, thank you very much, Cynthia. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Very good. Thank you, everyone.